a segment on feminism and women in Star Trek. Thank you, Kate. Oh, it took us 50 years to do this. Uh, we're going to bring out Amy right now. She's a wonderful talent, and we have an amazing group of people here that are going to be speaking to you. So, uh, Amy Imhoff will be introducing our group. Amy, come on out now, uh, here, and let's have a nice welcome for Amy Imhoff. Star Trek, and I'm so happy to introduce to you our panel of wonderful women. Uh, first up, we have a Mary Serwinski and B. Jo Trimble. Come on out, Mary and series online called Glue Guns and Phasers. I'm also in Star Trek Continues. And I'm just happy to be here. This is my sixth year uh, hosting and presenting this panel here at Star Trek Las Vegas. And I'm just so excited to finally be on the main stage. This is long overdue. And to have P.J. Trimble sitting next to me is quite an honor. So I'll pass it over to her because she's the reason why we are all here today. B. Joe and John Trimble have both been, yes, and he's, he's in the audience, so. Um, I've, I've been an sort of inadvertent feminist for most of my life because my mother was one of the early people who fought to be paid the same thing as men did doing the same job. So, yeah. That's what I mean. My name's Jara Hodge, and I'm one of the hosts of the Women at Work podcast. And, uh, I'm just so excited to be here today. I think this is my fourth year on this panel, and uh, I am so honored to be sharing a stage with Kate Mulker, who has played Captain Jamie, one of my biggest role models, and uh, Bijo Trimble, who, like Mary said, uh, has just contributed so much to our fandom, and looking forward to talking to you about women in Star Trek. Hi. <laughs> And I have the great privilege of having played the first, and as of this moment, the only female captain um, on the intrepid Star Trek Voyager. I'm now in a kitchen in a prison. And this is what happens when you get lost in the Delta Force. and I'm extremely honored to be sitting next to Kate Mulgrew. Um, I am a writer and blogger. I write for my own website, which is Shoes and Starships. I also contribute to Trek Movie, uh, The Mary Sue, and Screen Prism, as well as a regular writer on Legion of Leia. It's wonderful to be here and see everybody. Hello everyone, Hi, I'm Kayla Iacobino. I'm a volcano scientist by day, um, studying volcanoes around the world. Antarctica and North Korea. And uh, by night, I'm editor chief at trekmovie.com and uh, co host of the Shuttlepod podcast. And um, it's been many years that I've been on this panel with Mary and many of these lovely women here. And like Mary said, so excited to be on the main stage and sharing this with you all. Um, it's great to see that people are out here and want to be a part of this conversation. So. Well, this has been a 
monumental year for women. We're living in history right now. This is incredible that we have a woman who is a presidential nominee. The fact that young girls, younger than us, as we're now called women, <laughs> uh, have someone to look up to, to know that they can even take the highest position of power in this country. No matter how you fall on the political spectrum, it is an incredible accomplishment to have a woman go that far. And so to be here celebrating 50 years of Star Trek, knowing that women are at the forefront of Black Lives Matter, to know that women are coming out speaking about sexual assault and being incredibly brave, uh, I thought we would really, really like to honor the people behind the scenes of the original series. Obviously, Lieutenant Uhura on screen meant a lot not only to black women, but to women everywhere to hold a position that women in real life could not hold at that time. And, of course, Angel Barrett, who is the original number one in the pilot. Let's give her credit. meant a lot to me have been Dorothy Fontana and her incredible contribution to the character of Spock and to the animated series and of course the original. But Bijo, you being here next to me means a lot because you are responsible, you and your husband John, for the letter writing campaign that saved Star Trek and brought it back for a third season. So let's give her a round of applause. writing campaign led to the mobilization of women to form the first fan clubs and then fanzines. That, that was an interesting phenomenon because until then uh, star, uh, science fiction fandom was very male oriented and girls were, when I first entered it in 1952, um, but basically the it was about 18 guys to one girl, which is actually nice nods as far as I was concerned, but uh, <laughs> uh, the thing is, it's like, wow, you're a girl and you actually read, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, this sort of thing. And to see things develop then, and when the uh, write-in campaign started, we began getting more and more mail from women who basically wanted to know how to get this and run with it. and. Um, it was based, it was women who were doing a lot of the fan club starting and the fanzine printing. And I don't just mean the slash stuff, folks, but the real, you know, the, the genuine fanzines and that were, it, they were, and people, they were the people who pushed a great deal of it. We were very proud of that. And also the early attendees of the convention circuit, correct? Yes. Uh, there were a whole lot of more women than we, uh, than was ever expected. And that was very nice because um, uh, well, for, us, for one thing, it got more women out, and they were at first rather tender, and then they got so much approval from everyone, and this is the lovely thing about fandom is that you deal, you know, except for a few nerdies, but you deal with everybody on the same level, whether you have a physical or mental handicap, whatever color you are, um, you know, let's face it, in this convention you more green than you know. and, and this is a wonderful thing to have happen. And this is actually such an accepting group that women could come here and feel comfortable where they couldn't feel comfortable, even in the college groups that were set up for them. That's wonderful. It's, it's so refreshing to hear that we've always been a part of fandom and will continue to be a strong part of fandom. may or may not know about you is that you actually are responsible for some of the early merchandising of Star Trek. Uh, you started Star Trek Enterprises, which then became Lincoln Enterprises. You know it started as Lincoln Enterprises. Um, Gene, uh, uh, we, when the, we took f uh, film clips around. We just actually rescued them out of the uh, trash floor from uh, uh, the uh, filming department, uh, screening department, and uh, the um, that was, that was when people over at Paramount discovered I'm an incurable dumpster diver. And uh, <laughs> we're actually have, making other people do it. Why don't you go over there and get that? But um, we, uh, uh, the film clips went so well. And so John and I went back to Gene and said, you know, we think there's some merchandising ideas in here. <laughs> so um, 
he's, he's, he, he put us in, in charge of setting up Lincoln Enterprises because we had both run mail order companies before, little ones, and that's, so we started that. And it was really fun because, of, you know, again, the people who were responding and writing in and being encouraging and helpful and making a lot of suggestions, the bulk of them were women. So I really enjoyed that. And then Majel Barrett Roddenberry went to continue on the business from there. And it became Roddenberry.com. Right. And, you know, of course, by that time we had an internet, so, you know. <laughs> So what about the climate at the time of the letter writing campaign that was ripe for this type of movement and the publicity behind it? You know, it was the, you know, right on the precipice of the feminist movement. Right, all of a sudden women were speaking up and making, you know, a stir and, and ignoring all of this, let's not make any waves type of thing. And so it really it was, uh, this is why poor John got left out of it and I became the lady of John Star Trek because the news was more interested in the little housewife that spoke up than they were in the businessman. And so, you know, that was one of the factors. And I've, now, I, I worked for years to get poor John to get some credit because this is a husband of 56 years. I'm kind of fond of him. And, uh, so now, now here at this convention, we are vindicated. Thank you very much. Also, uh, in uh, 1972, the, uh, the first feminist bookstore in New York City put out a, a picture of one of the, the founders wearing a t-shirt that said, the future is female. And oh, that t-shirt wow. has recently recurred uh, with, our, you know, with our current political climate, with Hillary as the nominee, and just with women in general um, demanding what they're worth from Hollywood and, and from all over in every kind of industry. So I think that... Uh, maybe Kate can talk a little bit about the 70s and, and the kind of climate that you witnessed. The 70s? <laughs> I do have to say something. And I know that this is going to be sort of controversial. So what else is new, right? <laughs> I'm very honored to be on this panel with these feminist women who have made such remarkable advances. I'm acutely aware of the advances, and I too must acknowledge Hillary Rodham Clinton and her extraordinary efforts. But I will say this about myself regarding feminism. I have never called myself a feminist. I have just assumed my own independence from the time that I was born. Right on. Born to unorthodox parents, it wasn't discussed. It was absolutely taken for granted that you go forth in life with passion, with courage, with innovation. You don't complain, you don't explain, and you don't worry about being a boy or a girl. You just worry about developing your character and making a mark. I'm sorry that everybody thinks it's a man's world. Uh, I don't. I thought it's always been equal play. Uh, I'm glad to see that it's all politically sort of now coming up to a different standard. But uh, my feeling has always been, uh, I'm very lucky to be Kate. And that's the way it's been for me. Thank you. about was the role of women behind the scenes on Star Trek uh, across the generations. Obviously, um, for me, uh, I ended up going into kind of behind the scenes roles um, as a result of Star Trek. I wanted to be the one who wrote the stories. And um, I wonder, Bijo, if you could tell us a bit more about your experience with DC Fontana. And then after, if I could ask Kate to talk about your experience with Jerry Taylor, who I think is another one of the most significant women behind the scenes in Star Trek. Well, you know, uh, Dorothy Fontana, who originally had to go by the name D.C. Fontana initials, like Ursula Le Guin, they, they had to hide behind initials because men in, the, in charge did not feel that women could write exciting adventure or anything except cute romances. And, you know, that was something that the writers fought uphill for ages. And Dorothy took no prisoners. <laughs> she was, you know, she did. This was something up with which she was not ready to put. She did the initials at first, but then you notice that later on she was Dorothy C. Fontana. 
Uh, what she did to contribute basically to Star Trek, uh, by the way, Jean took her out of a, a secretarial typing pool and put her in charge of developing uh, the original series in, from, uh, for him, you know, and developing the characters. And that's where Spock stopped shouting, remember the first episodes, and became this very uber calm and restrained person because Dorothy told Jean that she felt that this would be far more appealing on all levels, and she was right. So uh, she worked very hard on a lot of things. She, uh, the, the filmation um, episodes went out and found the science fiction writers to write superb scripts. We won't talk about the animation, but you know, she was very much a power in the offices and with Jean, Jean listened to her. So that was some good. And by the way, a lot there were a lot of women working in the offices too. She kind of saw it out. Yeah, absolutely. I really um, enjoyed uh, the uh, the 50 Year Mission book that's just come out, and there's a lot of interviews in there um, with um, you're in there, women who are involved in fandom, but also um, Andy Richardson and some of the other women who are working behind the scenes in the original series. It's really illuminating. Um, so I'll pass it over to Kate then. Um, what was it like working with Jerry Taylor as executive producer, and what influence do you think that it has to have women behind the scenes as writers, directors, etc.? I'm going to have to redirect it to my original theory. Um, Jerry Taylor was the only uh, female executive producer. It was Rick Berman, Jerry Taylor, Michael Piller. And uh, whereas she was an extremely thoughtful, very uh, smart, uh, erudite woman, uh, my sympathies lay with Rick Berman. He wasn't really a writer. Uh, the men who came on board who understood how to write for women, I'd say, were Brandon Braga and Brian Fuller. Both of them were born in the great heights. Uh, was it fortifying to have a woman uh, as an executive producer? I suppose so. But uh, I, I liked Rick Berman, and I trusted him. For me, it's always been about what I get sort of viscerally from the other person. I wanted to kind of bring it into the influence that Janeway has had on this generation of women, women in science. Every time I see you at a convention, there's women who come up to you and say, I am a scientist because of Captain Janeway, I'm a doctor, you know, I decided to follow my dreams as a pilot. You know, for me personally, seeing someone on stage, I was raised in a very traditional household, so to see someone busting out of you... You were raised in a traditional household. <laughs> yes, I was. Look at her stockings. <laughs> no, um, uh, my parents had very, um, very typical gender roles. My, um, were they scientists? No, my, my father's an insurance agent. My mother's a homemaker. So she's father is an insurance agent. Your yes. mother is a homemaker. Yes. Your hair is purple, and you're wearing sort of galactic socks, stockings. It took me a long time to get to be this independent. Let's put it that way. I think you're great. Thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how you've interacted with fans and how you've... Um, Let me go back to Mrs. Level. Clinton. There you go. I know that you guys uh, largely object to any discussion of politics, as you should. Uh, in this venue, because we're talking about Star Trek. But uh, it was Mrs. Clinton who invited me to the White House at the end of the first season of Star Trek Voyager. It was Hillary Rodham Clinton. And why on earth she did, I still don't know, because I'm clearly not a scientist. I just played one on TV. <laughs> but she asked me to come and speak to women in science. And I did. I was thrilled, and I was, uh, at the same time, mortified. Because, of course, I'm not <laughs> a scientist. And they all came up to me after my rather strange, fragmented speech, which was full of apologies for being an actress and not a scientist, in fact. <laughs> they approached me, especially the young girls coming out of MIT, and they said to me, my father, who was also a scientist, told me that I am very bright and my future is full of promise in research. And then Star Trek Voyager came on the air, and my mother said, you might want to rethink that, darling. <laughs> and I'm going out. And they did. So the fact that Janeway made a difference in science has been, and I know that this is a terrible thing to say, but I think it is true, the single most gratifying aspect of having played that extraordinary game. <laughs> I can't give all the credit to Janeway, but um, you know, I grew up with the next generation, 
Um, and Next Generation for Space Nine Voyager you know, all influenced me to go into science. Uh, I was choosing between film, I wanted to either be working on science fiction television shows, um, you know, working behind the scenes, uh, directing or editing people like you, or I wanted to be doing the real science. And when I, I spent a semester in, in film school, that many people don't know this about me, so it's a very small part of my life. I spent a semester in film school, and after it was finished, I, I missed the real science. You know, I thought, you know, for me, at that time in my life, I, I realized why, you know, I, I can be, well, first of all, Hollywood, oh, what a hard world to break into. Well, I learned that science isn't that much easier, but anyway, <laughs> my mistake. But, uh, you know, I thought I can either be, be playing this on TV or I can actually go and live it every day. And um, so that's what drove me to, to do Tell them what you do. So, so fascinating. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a volcano scientist. Um, I study how the Earth works. Uh, volcanoes are, are the visceral expressions of you know, what the Earth is doing inside and out. Um, so I try to study our planet and, and what our planets and the other planets of, of the galaxy are made of. Um, right now I'm studying um, a volcano that's on the border between China and North Korea. Um, and we're working uh, with North Korean scientists in the country as part of a science diplomacy effort. May I ask you a question? May. What, which of all the volcanoes you've studied has taught you the most? Probably uh, Mount Pektu in North Korea, um, oh, oh, oh. which is where I'm currently studying. Um, because I've learned so much not only about volcanology, which yes, volcanology with an O, not a U. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can't imagine when I introduce people in, at Star Trek conventions as my, myself the volcanologist, I have to, I have to explain. <laughs> I scared the barber half to death the first time I met him when I introduced myself as a volcanologist. Uh, and it was love. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I've learned so much through my studies, not only about volcanoes, but about people um, and about different cultures. Um, just getting a peek at, you know, what the... Going inside. Yes, yeah, we were. How deep did you hear, okay? I'm sorry, aren't you interested? <laughs> How deep did you go? Um, so we fly into the capital city of Pyongyang from Beijing, and then we charter a plane and go up to the region where the volcano is, and we stay in a little town in a tourist hotel. Um, where only, you know, outsiders are only allowed to stay in certain hotels and interact with certain people. The volcano doesn't put you up? No, unfortunately. <laughs> I would love to camp out on the volcano, but... But no, we're not allowed to, it's, a very, it's because it's a border region. It's a really restricted area. So only certain people, even DPRK citizens, only very trusted people are allowed in that region. Um, so we're, we're, we drive in about an hour every day um, and then go and we work with the, the North Korean scientists in country and they, these are people who've been studying this volcano their entire life. But uh, because the border between Ch with China actually runs through the center of the volcano, um, scientists on both sides who have dedicated their entire lives to understanding this volcano have only ever seen it from one side. Um, and then people like myself and my group from, from the West, we get to go to both sides. What's the size of it? Um, it's about six kilometers across. What's that, this room? Four and a half miles? <laughs> Much better. <laughs> a four and a half miles across, it's a big caldera. It's a good thing. Have a lake inside <laughs> of it. I was in a tiny ship. <laughs> <laughs> a very good thing. Yeah, yeah, so, and I'm, I'm the, you know, the only female scientist um, in our group that's been going there. Good for you. The first, the first one. I also wanted to speak, if I may, while I have the floor. Um, I also wanted to speak a bit to, to what you said, because um, that actually really resonates with me. Um, I, uh, when, when you talk about that you don't label yourself as a feminist, and um, you almost uh, talk about it as if you're this dissenting opinion in the room, um, but, uh, you know, I, I actually wrote an article a few years ago um, where I said in this article, um, it was an article about feminist issues. Um, I was actually talking a lot about the Into Darkness movie um, and feminist issues in that film. And they had one sentence in there that's where I said, I'm not a feminist. I am by no means a feminist, but blah, blah, blah. And um, people in the comments, like, they say never read the comments, but I, I can't help myself. Um, a bunch of people called me out and said, I was with you until you said I'm not a feminist. And, um, you know, to be honest, at first I, I, was, I think I didn't understand what, the way some people use that word. Um, it's not examined when they use it that way, is it? It's not thoughtful. Yeah, but to say, I think I, I you know, to be honest, I think I changed my mind that day. Because, um, to, 
I am happy to label myself a feminist, feminist now. Um, I'm happy to have someone say I'm not a feminist and just talk about the issues, but if someone calls me a feminist, um, by, by the actual definition I am, and it's, uh, feminism is not women over men, you know, which is, how, which is what I thought it meant, which is why I said I'm not a feminist in that article. Um, it's, it's that women should be equal to men, and it shouldn't even be an issue. So I feel like your point is, why are we making this an issue? It doesn't need to be, and that resonates with me so much, because, you know, I grew up with Captain Janeway on the bridge of the Enterprise when I was in high school, and I, you know, I, I some, of, some of the fans who, who had been fans since the original series, um, I remember this was a big thing, the internet was new in those days, and people were going online saying, oh, you're the first female captain, this is great, you know, this is a big boon for us. You know, I wasn't a part of that movement. I just saw you on TV, and that's how it was. It never occurred to me that that was weird, you know? It, it never occurred to me that anyone would think that... Just as it never occurred to me that men were against women. So there's the free... No, I, if anything, it seemed to me we were all together. I remember saying when I was young that I wanted to be an astronaut going to space. And one of my family members said, well, what if your husband doesn't want you to? <laughs> And I said, well, then I'm going to divorce him. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, it depends on, on the environment, you know, what you're encouraged to do. And I, I was very lucky. I went to an all-girls high school, Catholic high school. <laughs> I had wonderful teachers and wonderful, full of wonderful. Surprise. I know, right? <laughs> um, but I had, a, you know, I had a lot of encouragement. And I think that makes a big difference in, you know, having, having people in your life. I, I, wrote, I wrote my college acceptance essay about Captain Janeway, so... That was, uh, that was um, a, a different aspect for me. You know, I'm, I'm not in the sciences, I'm in the humanities, which I think is you know, definitely more female dominated. What are you going to do with that? I have my master's in English Lit, and right now I am I'm an editor. I work for a, a technology company. Yeah. Oh. Oh. yeah, I mean, for me, that's the reason that I wanted to look at Star Trek from, like, the way that I look at feminism is it's, it's just about looking at different ways that our society is structured in different way, uh, parts of power and it's not an individual description of anyone's intention it's just looking say hey like gender is something that affects all of us and we can see this in star trek as well um that there's expectations on women and men and that it's it's cool to have discussions about how like sometimes the the stereotypes that people are put into is not really good for anyone and uh, it's not good for men either necessarily, and it certainly um, hurts uh, LGBTQIAP folks. So um, for me, like coming into Star Trek, um, being raised on that and, and really believing in the, the ideal of infinite diversity and infinite combinations, it was important to say like how is our fandom and how are these media, um, is, and is anyone being left out of this utopian vision of the future? Um, who is getting more screen time? Things like that. And just to say, what can we do better? Yesterday, Gates McFadden mentioned that um, Jonathan Frakes was encouraged to direct, encouraged, um, you know, he, Rick Berman was very open to having him direct, and he did quite a few episodes. But when she, she already had directing experience, and she mentioned that she had gone to him, but she only got to direct very late in the show, seven seasons, so she, she said, I have a caveat to, to what you said, and it's that, you know, I, I haven't uh, had the opportunity to, um, it wasn't as easy for women to, to get, get up there and direct Star Trek. Because we have limited time, we should take a couple of these questions, don't Yeah. We? Let's start down over here with this young lady. Hi. Oh, my goodness. Hi, my question is for Kate. Uh, I'm someone who wants to have both a career and a family. And I've always been a big fan of Voyager, of you. You're such an inspiration to me. And while watching Endgame, we see Janeway, Admiral Janeway in this big empty house, and I was wondering what your view is on that, as you know, she seems to have chosen a career over a family as opposed to having both. She did. But in the end, she didn't. Did she? She sacrificed her younger self. She sacrificed her older self, conceivably her lonely self, for her younger, vibrant self. That was my, I was in, I had my hand in Endgame. Uh, I think Jane May did, absolutely, choose uh, her career. Well, I didn't have much of a choice, did I? <laughs> Do you remember the phone call? He called me and said, I don't think I can wait for you, but here's a picture of the dog. <laughs> 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 
for dear Janeway, dear Janeway, and I think it was absolutely appropriate. You know, I've always said uh, they they wanted to get me involved with, uh, I think Robert Bell Trump. Yeah, yeah, they wanted to have some sex. They like sex on Star Trek. Well, we all like sex, don't we? Don't we? Yeah, we all do. And Trekkers like it, in particular. You did, you of course did get together. Pardon me? Of course did get together with one male member of the cast. Robin McNeil. Tom, Tom Paris, yes. We have lizards in the journal. <laughs> we had about 300 baby lizards. Yes. Uh, and where are they today? A carnal, a carnal moment of such erotic proportions. <laughs> so to answer your question, yes, she did, and she did the right thing. It's not for every woman, but it was right for her. All right. Thank you very much. I like this color. Hi, so this is for Kate and anyone else who would like to comment on it. Um, one of the things that really made an impression on me in watching Voyager was the mentoring relationship between Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine, and also between Seven of Nine and Naomi Wildman. That was really powerful for me because I hadn't seen a lot of mentoring in real life or on TV, woman to woman, and I wonder if any of you would like to comment on that. I'd like to hear what the ladies have to say. Well, I love that you said that Janeway didn't rule by a dictatorship, she ruled by a higher femininity, and I wanted to know what you, you meant by that because that struck me as like the perfect balance because she was in command, however she consulted with her crew. She knew when to doubt herself or when to get opinions of others and be very inclusive. And uh, for me as someone who suffered with uh, depression and many other issues throughout my whole life, it meant something to me to see someone on screen who was flawed, who doubted herself at times. In that episode, thank God, oh my goodness. then I succeeded. It was amazing though, it's refreshing because real women are not perfect. You know, we don't always have it together. And it was, it was... Nobody's perfect. No one is perfect. Who's exactly. perfect? Right. And to see you on... You think Jean-Luc Picard was perfect? <laughs> <laughs> and I know that Mr. Shatner's in the building, but do you think he was perfect? <laughs> <laughs> he does. Those captains were very busy. by now. <laughs> but the mentor relationship with the other uh, crew women, with, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I love that because I had a great relationship with my grandmother. She made me everything I am today and inspired me on so many levels. And, and so to see that, to see women backing each other up instead of tearing each other down was incredible for someone growing up in the 90s. But when did they ever tear each other down? Did they tear each other down? No, but in real life, years? women. There weren't enough of them yeah. to do that. But that's but what I'm talking about when I say they don't know who they are. If you know who you are, you don't tear somebody down. Unless they pissed you off. One of my favorite Captain Jamie quotes is she says, I dread the day that everyone on this ship agrees with me. And I love how I felt that you know, her crew could approach her and say, hey, I just have like a reasonable concern about this issue and she would hear them out. And I think she did that more than any other captain and it was a really good leadership skill to see her exemplify and I, I love the relationship she had with She was driven by her humanity, but to that lovely woman's point earlier, her loneliness uh, expressed itself in her longing to be accessible emotionally to the crew. I wanted to love and to be loved. And I think that that's probably what Janeway did a little more than the uh, chaps, right? <laughs> We're getting the, uh, the wrap it up, wrap it up signal. But if um, you guys see us around the convention hall, and uh, see Mary over at the Roddenberry booth, um, and the B. Jo as she goes around and, and chats with her adoring public. And you can also see Kate later today at 4 o'clock on stage, taking all your questions. They're giving me the they're giving me the wrap it up signal. You've been great. Thank you very much.